Esteemed guests, I would like to welcome you. We will be discussing an important issue today. The PKK structure in Syria. As you all know, Turkey has conducted an operation in the Afrin region and we see national and international ramifications. It will have serious results in Syria. We know that the Syrian crisis entered a new stage, a new phase. And the PKK network in Syria is a direct threat to Turkey's national security. That's the perception on Turkey's side. And the establishment of a PKK state in northern Syria cannot be ignored by the Turkish state as this organization has conducted terrorist attacks against the Turkish state for the last three decades and we lost thousands of citizens. If PKK established a state in another location of the world, Turkey might have turned a deaf ear to that. Uh, however, we have a 900 kilometer border with Syria and the establishment of such a state there and it's getting support by certain allies is a serious security threat to Turkey. We experience, in fact, the ramifications in everyday life. We see terrorist attacks where civilians lo lose their lives. PKK also attacks civil servants such as teachers just because they are civil servants. They abduct doctors and they kill those doctors. They also carry out attacks against civilians with bombardments, regardless of whether they are women, elderly, or children. So this is a f terrorist organization in every sense. And they are now located in Syria, supported by many actors to be manipulated against Turkey. They became an actor of the Syrian crisis now. And that is, as I told you, a huge crisis in terms of Turkey. Of course, the PKK network has been discussed with regards to Syrian branch. And we have four important speakers here. I'd like to introduce them briefly. First, I'd like to start with Mr. Siamant Hedro, who comes from Berlin. He, is, he has graduated from political sciences in Berlin. After completing his education, he worked as a lecturer and researcher at Free University of Berlin and the University of Cologne. Since 2002, he is working as a scholar at the European Center for Kurdish Studies in Berlin, whose co-founder he is. In 2012, he became representative of the European branch for the Kurdish Future uh, Movement in Syria. Since 2014, he is the party's president. Moreover, since 2016, Mr. Hajra is a member of the Foreign Committee of the Kurdish National Council in Syria. However, he quitted that uh, position very recently. So he will, in fact, he has a uh, huge experience and knowledge regarding Syria's uh, organization in uh, Syria. We have also Kyle Orton here, who has his master's at Liverpool University in Social Sciences. It says a study involved working with Syrian refugees in Lebanon to assess whether their needs were being met. He worked freelance for a while, focused on Syria. He worked at the London think tank for two years, covering Syria and regional terrorist groups, including ISIS and PKK. And there is foreign tourist terrorist fighters uh, report uh, regarding Syria. We have a third speaker, Eva Sewellsberg, who studied philosophy, sociology, and German literature in Munich and Berlin. After completing her studies, she worked as a lecturer and researcher in Kurdish studies projects at the Freie University of Berlin and the University of Cologne. Since 1999, she has been president of the European Center for Kurdish Studies in Berlin. Since 2005, she has been responsible for the implementation of numerous human rights and pro-democracy projects in Syria. Moreover, she wrote extensively on the current political developments in Kur Kurdish Syria and Iraq. The last speaker is Jan Ajum, a SETA researcher. He works as a researcher at SETA Foreign Policy Directorate. He graduated from Department of International Relations, Middle Eastern, uh, Eastern Mediterranean University. He did his master's in the Department of Political Science and Inter International Relations at Yeltsin University. He had an interest 
Cultural Dialogue Education in Canada. He carried on works and studies on Egypt and Cairo Turkey Research Center. Currently, he carries on studies and research on Egypt and Middle East in SETA Ankara, and he has a report regarding PYD and YPG uh, organization in Syria, which you can get uh, on our website. I'd like to start by start with uh, Professor Ajun. I'd like to ask how PKK was uh, settled in uh, Syria, how what kind of progress it made uh, together with the Syrian crisis. Now that he has an article on that, I think he can start by elaborating on the issue. I think the professor has a presentation. Could you turn that on? Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much. Here we are addressing a very complex issue and we know that there are many actors involved as this is a proxy war between different actors and PYD, YPG emerged as an actor in that context. You see a map behind me and this map shows the PYG and PYD structure at the the arm of the PKK in Syria. Here we, we talk about a 900 kilometer line and almost 600 kilometer of which uh, is under control of this structure. Similarly, we can include Deirizor and Raqqa in, in this map, which means one fourth of the whole country, whole Syria being controlled by this organization. That means they have the important resources of country extending all the way from Deirizor to Aseki. And also we see the Topka Dam, the most important electricity dam in the country, uh, controlling the agricultural areas coming from Euphrates and Tigris. And this structure, in fact, administers a significant part of the country as it established a line with northern Iraq and the Iraq leg of it concerns Sinjar as it is also under their control and structure together with its cooperation with the United States also uh, focuses on uh, America's uh, exposure or cloud area, you see the American uh, flags there, which includes 13 military bases in Rim Rimnan, and you see also airports. So this is an organization threatening Syria's, in fact, territorial unity. This organization is based not only in Syria, but also appears as a phenomenon uh, which is in fact in alignment with PKK organization in many other countries. KJK or KJK uh, is the umbrella organization here and in Iraq it uh, defines itself as PJKD and PEJAK in Iraq and PY, it appears as PYD in Syria. Of course, such structure has a historical background in Syria, and I would like to refer to this historical development and the organic connection between PYD and PKK. Basically, the presence of PKK in Syria dates back to 1980s when Abdullah Öcalan fled Turkey and entered the country and Muhaberat, the intelligence agency of Syria, works together with Öcalan and he moves to Afrin after a temporary settlement there. And the main organization structure of PKK is organized there. Before Öcalan makes that uh, move to Syria, yes, PKK appeared as a terrorist organization in Turkey, but it didn't have a meaningful structure. Syrian intelligence agency turned it into an entity and the Syrian uh, regime had certain geopolitical problems with Turkey including Hatay issue, water 
usage issue. So they wanted to instrumentalize, turn PKK into an instrument. That's why they started investing in the organization. Also, they wanted to export their own Kurdish issue through PKK to Turkey, as there was an, uh, in fact, dense Kurdish population in northern uh, Syria, and they had a serious problem with the regime. So they, in fact, sort of exported this issue to Turkey with PKK. That's why Muhaberat, the Syrian intelligence, opened a huge area for uh, PKK, and they uh, established training camps in Beka and Lebanon so that it can become a full-fledged terrorist organization. Of course, the 1990s Gulf War and the situation in Iran opened new ways for PKK. The regime assisted PKK for their military base in Kandil, and Iraq also uh, made important uh, contributions in terms of turning it into a regional entity. Of course, Turkey had strained relations with Syria due to PKK and together with the dissolution of the Soviet bloc, and Syria was in fact left alone. That's why Turkey started to make military threats and they had to revise their PKK policy and deported Öcalan. And in fact, they had a genuine uh, struggle uh, towards with PKK uh, standing next to Turkey. That's why PKK established PYD as a new structure in Syria. In fact, the date is uh, 16th of February 2002, when Öcalan gave this order to Kandil, uh, instructing them to establish PYD structure in Syria. And in their aid uh, organization, they took a decision to establish PYD. And on the 17th of uh, September 2003, PYD structure came into existence in uh, Syria based on this order of PKK and they continued to organize certain congresses in Syria whereby they took various decisions for example PKK, KJK, uh, Martyr, Ayhan camp turned into uh, one of the main holds, uh, str strongholds of uh, PYD and also I will share you important information regarding Shaheen Jilo, as he has strong relations with the U.S. Uh, it was, in fact, identified as the main uh, spokesperson of PYD. Shaheen Jilo conducted uh, the relations between the two organizations and other actors. In this period, he we see Barazani Mohammed as the first president of P. Uh, YD, and he was assigned by PKK. You see his photograph with Karayilan. Barazani Muhammad was followed by Salih Muslim as the co-president together with Asya Abdullah. And you see Salih Muslim's photos with Karayilan, Duran Kalkan, other PKK members. This structure, in fact, started to build up its existence in a gradual fashion in Syria, but they continued to have problems with the regime as they started to fight with this organization. The regime started to fight with organization together with Turkey. We see certain members being arrested and their leaders had to flee to Kandil Mountain. And in fact, they lost their existence in Syria considerably until 2011 Syrian revolution, which created completely different dynamics. One of the most important ones concerned, in fact, was related to the Syrian, uh, the Kurdish in northern Syria, and it, in fact, made us remember this engagement with PKK. And secondly, Turkey lent the support to uh, regime, in fact, opposition there. Since this connection was uh, lost, they, the organization started to resume their rela rela uh, relations with PKK, starting with Salih Muslim, 
uh, we saw that uh, certain leaders from Kandil was were allowed to enter uh, Syria, and 600 convicts were left were released free by the regime. And again, Haseki or Jazeera Canton, as they call it, in fact, uh, saw that the regime army retreated, leaving this space to PKK. So this relationship uh, born its fruit. First, PKK uh, targeted oppositional Kurds, extending their leaders to exile, and tens of thousands of Kurdish uh, people that were opposition to PKK had to flee to Turkey, uh, Iraq, and certain other areas. And this structure created this YPG structure, and they started to fight with the regime together with opposition forces controlling many northern uh, Syria regions. Then the Canton project uh, was implemented. Iron uh, and Afrin Jazeera Cantons were created. So that m meant an effective activity area. Again, in the course of PKK's Syrian organization, uh, the appearance of Daesh or ISIS is another factor. Their instant uh, entrance to uh, Syria meant that they would target uh, PKK controlled areas, and Ain al Arab Kobani siege is an important milestone as the United States, starting with mid 2014, provided this. Uh, organization with air support, and they started this engagement with the organization, I mean, between America and PKK. So this relationship started to change its nature, starting with this air aerial campaign. They uh, started to provide weapons, and then American soldiers, uh, in fact, started to be deployed uh, in uh, Kurdish-controlled or PKK-controlled areas, providing uh, military training, so they sort of turned into, in fact, uh, an army. Uh, and as the regime started to weaken, PK, PKK started to get stronger, and their area of influence was expanded with the U.S. support. We are not talking about uh, only uh, densely populated uh, Kurdish areas, Raqqa, Deir, Membij, uh, and other Arab regions were taken uh, uh, under control with the American support also. Uh, we see that important natural gas, uh, oil areas, and uh, Tapka then uh, was uh, sort of uh, was controlled, and the nature of this relationship started to change. We can open a Russia parenthesis with respect to Afrin. As you know, Russia intervened in the civil war in Syria in mid-2015, and uh, it started to target uh, opposition forces, and uh, together with the, uh, in fact, hit together with the uh, hitting of a plane by the Turkish uh, state, we saw that Syria started to uh, get uh, Kurdish groups started to get Russian support, and here we see two belts. Mm, PKK existence in Membij, including eastern side, including Membij, and uh, Afrin area. Afrin, in fact, is was a region shaped by uh, the regime. However, uh, the structured organization in eastern Syria was controlled by America. And the PKK existence, in that sense, had an influence on Afrin. And they started to, uh, they were able to guide the relations in uh, Afrin. That's the historical course of the development of this organization. Here we see PKK established by Abdullah Öcalan and KJK structure, which houses PYD. I tried to provide a historical course. Rojova uh, autonomous uh, structure, again, has a direct relationship with them. 
and they are administered by a Canton, Canton system. Uh, YPJ is the female version of uh, uh, YPG, and also we see Syrian Democratic Alliances, uh, pow powers, forces uh, supported by America. We see Stora Milices, Militia again, which are uh, military forces. We said that there is an organic relationship between this structure and PKK, and we see many evidence, much evidence about that, not just based on the photos taken uh, together with PKK leaders, their own official statuses. Uh, and in our SETA report, we translated this statute into Turkish and published it. In their official statute, they position themselves very clearly, saying that PYD considers Abdullah Öcalan as the leader of the whole Kurdish people. And I showed you the KJK structure, and Kongregel is the highest legislature body for the Kurdish people, they say. There are interesting articles, again, uh, about the uh, party organization. It says, leader Abdullah Öcalan, feeling proud of Abdullah Öcalan and the Kurdish people uh, requires uh, fighting to ensure salvation for Kurdish people. So the statute says that uh, Öcalan, as the party leader, need to be s need to go through salvation, need to be rescued. And also, democratic leadership uh, program uh, should be endorsed in the party uh, as supported by Abdullah Öcalan. So they clearly state in their official statute that they are the uh, Syria arm of PKK. And we see that import important names close the PKK mention, uh, manages this PYD. And here we see the Syrian senior permanent uh, decision committee, Bahauzar, is number one. And together with Shahin Jilo, he manages the military developments in Syria. After getting wounded in an attack, he uh, delegated his duty to Shahin Jilo, who is a very key figure, as he had the full responsibility regarding the uh, military structure. Again, he was the commander of HPG, the military arm of PKK, and he is called as the uh, in fact, spiritual uh, son of Abdullah Öcalan. And you see other names as like Hanefi, who are important leaders of the organization. This is an important photo as well. You see Aldar Halil here. Aldar Halil is, has a senior managerial role in PYD, and he had this photo taken together with. PKK militia, Hamza Bokan. Hamza Bokan is another person who was convicted in Germany due to becoming a member of terrorist organization. Hakkı Gabar is the Botan field commander of PKK, and this is a photo taken with them. You can find hundreds of photos like this. This is a new organizational chart, if you may, comprised with such names. And here you see the official spokesperson, Halal, uh, Halal Silo, uh, who provided this after taking siege in Turkey. And you see that, you, you see that they tell us how they manage this structure in Euf Western Euphrates. And as Silo mentioned, you see Shaheen Jio as one of the main actors, and he has this contact touch with American command commanders, including Brad Bird, and Shaheen Jio had this footage with American commanders after an attack, a certain attack on Turkey. In this context, 
PKK has a complete organic relationship uh, between its Syrian arm, PYD. Let me also state this. There are certain statistics here. YPG lost certain warriors in 2013 and 2016. Half of them originated from Turkey and they in fact went through uh, prosecution uh, for becoming PKK members in the past. Again, certain interviews shows that for example in a PKK member interview they ask are you a PKK member they say I'm Pejak in Iran PJTK in Iraq in PYD in Syria so this is a militia pool of PKK and if needed the organization can in fact ensure that these elements are switched to different countries Pejak was created to fight against Iran but after their agreement with Iran their militias were considerably moved to uh, HPG as we called or Syria similarly we see that important number of uh, organization members uh, switched, switched to Syria after a while you see the distribution of the armed uh, branch of PYD they tried to increase their existence in Turkey and Syria and it has been in favor of Syria especially in recent years another important issue concerns uh, this terror uh, terrorist belt in Syria and their role in uh, terrorist attacks in Turkey as you know there was this uh, solution process in Turkey I don't know whether you read Imral notes which communicates the uh, discussions between Öcalan and state officials one of the reasons why this solution process came to an end was that Turkey did not accept the gains so-called gains uh, ensured by the Syria arm of the organization and uh, Turkey's rejection of that caused that solution process to come to an end well I will wrap it up Mr. Moderator and after that they started to use that PYD uh, death in Syria and that they use uh, these uh, people in attacks against Turkey here you see the transit points including Afrin uh, and other points where which are used by PKK Ainul Arab or Haseki uh, in fact provided huge support in this ditch uh, resistance against the Turkish state in southern southeastern Turkey and eastern Turkey again you see the weapon systems provided by the US to organization members which who use that in in fact their attacks within Turkey you see the for example uh, they provide 500 millions of weapon support to organization and this number does not include the other hidden support I would like to complete my presentation with this photo I will try to address your questions if you have any here you see the spiritual son of Öcalan the special uh, forces commander of uh, HGP and you see American commanders including brother Halim so you and uh, American commander and brother Helen so you see that the US knows that they will use uh, this organization for their benefits as they create a region and they have these excellent centers for fight against uh, terror and they know that PYD is the PKK arm of Syria they have official statements in that sense too but they continue to uh, support P uh, organization against Turkey thank you very much professor well, if you very well explained how uh, that is used by the or abused by the regime over there, and 
we know that the Kurdish people have not been granted a citizenship living in the region. And that problem is exported to Turkey by them, uh, hence getting rid of that problem. But then in the Syrian war, you said that that was reactivated, which was an interesting observation. Now, well, of course, while all these things are happening, uh, the Kurds in the northern Syria, just like in Turkey and in northern Iraq, uh, it's not possible to state that they're all uh, supporting PKK, uh, even though this is the impression they would like to live uh, in the Western media. The real problem of Turkey is in this respect with PKK, the terrorist organization. But there is this impression uh, which they try to live in the Western media. We see it in on some uh, channels. Uh, lately, it was uh, on CNN. Uh, I'm going to read the title. The world's most progressive democracy is being born. Don't let it get strangled. So that is done, what they mean, by PKK, and just don't uh, let it disappear. Well, is it indeed the case, the best democracy? Uh, is it really established over there? I would like to ask this to distinguish Siaman Tajo. So you are a Syrian Kurdish uh, citizen person. What was your personal experience with uh, that uh, organization? Uh, what kind of policy was established? Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Ja, vielen Dank. Um, ich muss gestehen, ich habe selber keine persönliche Erfahrung äh, mit der PKK. Ich äh, kann aus ähm, Ich bin selber ähm, äh, seit äh, 78 nicht äh, in Syrien gewesen. Ich lebe in Deutschland, ähm, aber ähm, meine Partei ist in Syrien tätig und äh, auch äh, zahlreiche andere kurdische Gruppierungen, äh, die in Opposition zu äh, PED stehen. Ähm, wir wissen, dass nachdem die syrische Revolution angefangen hat, äh, im März äh, 2011, um, in, uh, am Anfang in einigen Well, uh, at the very beginning, thank you very much, by the way, for giving me the floor. Um, at the very beginning, there were some protests against the Syrian regime, but in a very short period of time, the protests, uh, there were some protests in the uh, Kurdish region. We know that until that time, the Syrian Arab opponent uh, level was very low. It was as if it was none. And uh, the only political group in Syria was uh, and you know, the, the, the political parties uh, the, uh, indeed constructed a very good network and they were the Kurdish parties with a very good network. Even though uh, they were working uh, um, with, at a certain level, uh, there was still a very good organization, a level of organization, of institutionalization. And that was posing a threat for the Syrian regime. Well, but of course with the, even though there were some collaboration with the Arabic regime. Uh, well, the Syrian regime had some concerns because this group was very well organized and uh, they did not want really this to uh, actually collaborate with the Arabic opposition, the Arab opposition, uh, because that would mean that there was a threat and they, uh, that would mean that they have to take uh, a measure uh, they made great use of Sirat el Abani, the former Iraqi president uh, Bashar al-Assad um, and his family uh, had some relationships in 50s and 60s in Damascus. Uh, they were living in um, uh, Damascus and Sirat el Abani saw the fact that as an intermediary um, in terms of the um, Iran, Iranian government and PKK well, of course, right from the very beginning, Iranians, uh, Iran was in favor of the regime. 
and they always supported the, the, the Syrian government, Syrian administration, and in such negotiations that this was decided P PYD, and as you very rightfully indicated, this is the Syrian PKK organization, would t take control of the Kurdish regions, uh, they would take control of such regions, and in return for that, all of the uh, antagonist voices vis-a-vis -vis the uh, system or the regime would be simply uh, silenced down. The protests would be eliminated. And indeed, in a very short period of time, PYD, um, in terms of the young activists, uh, they arrested the young activists um, because they were protesting against the regime. And since 2012, uh, there has been a pressure and oppression utilizing a number of different instruments. Uh, on one hand, there was, there has been the radical Kurdish political personalities who are known to be against the regime have been uh, intimidated. For example, Meshat Kemal, uh, who is a spokesperson of my party, uh, was uh, assassinated in 2011. Um, and Mishra Kamal uh, uh, was in favor of uh, collaborating with the Syrian opposition or working together with the Syrian opposition. There was only one reason for this assassination, which was as follows. Uh, so, uh, you know, you know, he's sending such a signal to the political leaders. If you're against the regime, this is how you're going to end up. This was actually, you know, the, the instrument of intimidation for these people. And in addition, the young act, they started to sink the track, follow uh, the young activists since 2013. 15 political activists, uh, who were organizing the protests or rallies were assassinated. Uh, and the Kurdish origin, they also started uh, some activities vis-a-vis -vis the Kurdish origin parties as well. So at the beginning, uh, you know, they stayed away from such parties, but we know that Von 14 Kurdischen Parteien gab die in the Kurdish region in Syria, there was a union uh, comprised of 14 parties uh, against PYD. This structure was against PYD. So in this respect, they were not touching those, but they were simply uh, pursuing step by step. But And then there were interventions. First, they uh, started to keep track of the, uh, the young activists, and then the critical small parties were threatened, and then the Kurdish National Council was threatened. More than 40 uh, opponents uh, were assassinated. And the young activists as well as the members of the Kurdish National Party. So when you look at the ideology of PYD, was not uh, suitable or apt in terms of uh, sharing the power. Uh, it is uh, actually very much similar to the Ba'ath Party. We know that the Syrian regime or the Ba'ath Party uh, was ready to take on the full uh, world, uh, on the whole country, but they were not ready to share the power. Likewise, you know, uh, the same thing goes for PYD with PKK. Uh, they were seeing, they see themselves as the mayor and, you know, one representative of the Kurdish people. And anyone who does not want to obey them, are, uh, they are announcing those people as the enemies of the Kurdish people. And their, you know, duty is to simply combat those people according to them. So, now when you look at the existing situation, they are trying to get hold of and control of the whole uh, Kurdish uh, region. Uh, it's almost impossible. Uh, to act as a, uh, you know, a, a, act politically. The Kurdish National Council is still in existence in the region. For example, uh, almost none of those 
Turkey Park Office is of the, uh, you know, of the places where there is Kurdish National Council is active. They were either attacked, they were either attacked, or uh, they were simply uh, they were attacked by the raging uh, masses of people. So they had to simply close down the offices. Uh, a different political that you know they're not allowing uh, any uh, other critical political movement. Uh, they are trying to simply hinder their activities. And uh, the General Assembly of Kurdish National Council was supposed to take place three uh, months ago, but they were attacked by this uh, wing. And, uh, you know, Ben Eyl, uh, the president of the Kurdish National Council, uh, at midnight was taken, uh, grasped from his uh, house, and he was taken outside the border and he was threatened. If you go back, you're going to be eliminated and assassinated. So since then, he is uh, simply sent on exile. Uh, he lives abroad. So this was actually a very brief summary of the political deterioration uh, or destruction. The other thing is the administration. So on paper, uh, they seem very democratic, complying with the democratic rules. Every decision is simply voted and taken by the uh, essential council, and every decision is justificated and voted and taken democratically. And when you look at their officially announced program and do a reality check, uh, it's just like the Green Book of Gaddafi. Uh, so the older people you know, would know that, the Green Book by Gaddafi. Uh, so in that uh, Green Book, uh, you know, there's an essential democratic system is assumed. It's as if, you know, uh, giving all the power to the people. But in reality, this is not the case. The theory and practice actually differ from one another. Well, in, Ku in Kurdistan, they claim that, you know, they, the, the, the people, the citizens take the uh, decisions. But it's just like Gaddafi's system. Every, actually, every decision is imposed from top to bottom. There is a group uh, who are taking the decisions. And for the Syrian Kurds, uh, to manage them directly, you know, there is this administration and there is no freedom of decision. The CNN uh, employees, if that th those CNN employees had spent some time over there, those titles would be rather different, which we have just indicated. Uh, and uh, in the press, we see there is misinformation, quite a lot actually, there is this ignorance and misinformation. Um, uh, you know, if you go to Kur Siri, Syria and Kurdistan and spend two weeks there, PYD and my PG personnel would accompany you. You're allowed to, to speak to only a number of people. And when you speak to those people, you know, you go back uh, home with such an interest. That's how you actually cover it in the press as well to the Western world. Another aspect, you know, if this administration were indeed democratic, as they claim it to be, and they were indeed really, if they were fighting for the interests or the best interests of their people, in that case, in a region where there are uh, two, hundred, two and five uh, million people are inhibiting, um, not it wouldn't be the case where 800,000 people were living this region. So uh, since 2011, uh, more than 800,000 people uh, left uh, the place. More than 300,000 refugees are living here. And in Turkey, around 450,000 Kurdish uh, refugees are living. Almost 200,000 uh, refugees uh, simply fled from Syria to Europe. But of course, that has a lot to do with the war. But even more than that, it has to do with the policies which were administered vis-a-vis -vis the public. In 2014, uh, they, uh, it, you know, it started, they started the practice of the compulsory um, army service, the military service, which means that uh, now, even if you are 40, well, it used to be, the age threshold used to be 35. Now, you know, if you are younger, if you are 40 or younger than 40, you have to serve in the army. This was not seen before in the partisan group or in the Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, it's, you know, when there was an, a Kurdish administration, Peshmerges were the uh, armies of volunteers, whereas PYD in the Kurdish regions, 
are simply implementing the compulsory army, the mandatory army service, which meant that many young people had to flee the country. Uh, and, you know, the members of different uh, Kurdish parties uh, were not convinced by the PKK ideology. They were simply flat refusing the ideology of PKK. And uh, they don't accept to fight for such a group. The ideology is not accepted. And they claim that, uh, you know, they're not going to fight for that and they flee the country. Another important reason is many families had to leave their country. In 2016, uh, started a new schooling system. Um, well, the schools in the regions under PYD control, starting from the first to the third class, uh, the education language is only Kurdish. Between four and six. Uh, classes. Arabic could be the second language, only two uh, hours a week, which means that uh, if the people would like to continue their education and uh, attend college, uh, they cannot uh, receive education in Arabic. So, you know, even if they do so, they don't have any opportunity to go to college because it is at a very uh, late age that they uh, start learning Arabic. So it's as if, uh, you know, the, it's the, the first language in schools is Kurdish and that poses a big problem. The second thing is, uh, even if they can re receive an education in Arabic, uh, the central administration does not accept that. There is not an international recognition, even though they graduate from schools over here, which means that, you know, these children have no prospects for the future, uh, which also, uh, means that the families, in order to secure uh, the future of their children, they need to flee the country. So, you know, there is also the forced uh, recruitment, uh, the conscription uh, of the young, of the youth into the army. We uh, receive regular reports of those forced uh, recruitment of the youngsters into the army at the age of 13, 14, even 15 by, by uh, the government. Uh, you know, they are forced uh, to use weapons arms and they are recruited into the army and there are many children or uh, um, adults, adolescents who are simply uh, becoming casualties in the armed conflicts. And um, as I have indicated at the very beginning, uh, the political parties uh, have, you know, they can't work here. The political parties cannot into conduct their activities here. That's why there is only one group in the Kurdish regions who are dominating uh, the region, and they have the full. Uh, they have received the full control over the you know whole population, and the problem in this respect is it's not that you know only uh, the support of the Americans or the Western world. But, or you know, uh, having the having received the Western sympathy. But of course, this is not the whole uh, Western world. Many countries in the Western Europe uh, are not collaborating with PYD. You know, that's a fact. And we know that they are not ready to invest in the Kurdish region. In addition to that, economic wise, economy wise, from an economic perspective. Uh, there are challenging conditions for the region. So, these are, even though these are relatively safe places, these are under the control, these places are un under the control of PYD. Hence, there is no willingness in, on the side of the Western world to invest in such uh, regions. Uh, and economically, that is posing challenges for the region as a result of which the people have to flee. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, for this address. Uh, I think I have complied with my 15 uh, minutes uh, time restriction. Thank you so much. Mr. Speaker, in fact, provide a very good summary of how PKK creates 
a terrorist organization there. The likening of this organization to Baal's party, in fact, uh, is, a, is a remarkable point. Also, Professor John previously mentioned about the Muhaberats and Baal's uh, influence on uh, the establishment of the organization. So this is unfortunately a switch from an authoritarian regime to another authoritarian regime, whereas this is marketed as the most advanced democracy Emergent, emerging democracy, and it's the Kurdish people that, in fact, uh, bears the burden, the cost of it, as uh, Professor Sia mentioned, as they apply forced conscription. In fact, we see it in Turkey as well. If you read their establishment papers of uh, KJK or PKK, uh, we see that they have this weird language, democratic and ecologic society, they say, uh, gender, uh, f targeting gender freedom. Well, this is something uh, created in mind, although there is not a reality supporting that. And also, Prof Mr. Siamant mentioned that there are certain countries putting distance between themselves and PYD, like the UK, including the UK. But we see that this is mostly both. This marketing is mostly both in the press. They say, for example, the guerrillas do not even, uh, in fact, throw their cigarettes uh, in the mountains. Uh, or we see women being, uh, for example, brought to the foreground. Well, we may ignore that, maybe, but this is the other side of the border where see where uh, an oppressive region, we may focus on Aleppo or other regions, but this is clear that we see human rights violations there and some of them were covered by the uh, international watchdogs. I would like to ask this to uh, Miss Eva. What are the human rights uh, violations? Uh, well, we see them, for example, on the media press, but maybe you can el elaborate on that. Thank you very much. already focused on human rights violations. He more or less um, uh, mentioned everything I was going to say. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now, I guess I somehow have to improvise a little bit and just try to, um, uh, yeah, to add a few points um, uh, fortunately he forgot to say, but I'm not gonna repeat everything um, uh, he said, I think. So um, I think Siamat was talking about um, uh, forced recruitment. He was talking about forced recruitment of young men and he was also talking about forced recruitment of children, which is all very well documented. I think um, the important or an interesting point about this forced recruitment is that it shows very well something which is often um, uh, forgotten when talking about um, uh, the PYD and the situation in um, Syrian Kurdistan. And this is that the PYD is far less popular in those regions than a lot of people um, think. If you're reading um, uh, the Western press, we, or large parts of the Western press, and uh, we already mentioned this kind of um, uh, articles, then you very easily get the idea that all people in Syrian Kurdistan really support the PYD and believe um, uh, that this is a good uh, organization which is um, uh, doing good governance and these kind of things. And I think forced recruitment, I mean, we have to ask why does the PYD imply forced recruitment? And I believe this is definitely because they do not find enough volunteers which are willing to really um, uh, go into the PYD. We do have some statistics which are also um, uh, supported by different um, think tanks which show that about 50% of all those fighting in the ranks of the PYD are indeed not Kurds being born in Syria, but Kurds being born in Turkey. So um, uh, it's quite clear that even though the PYD is using forced recruitment, even though the PYD is using the recruitment of children, and even of very young children, children as young as 12 or 13 years old, even though it is um, uh, doing all these kind of practices, nevertheless, they do not have enough fighters in Syrian Kurdistan in order to fill their ranks there and in order to um, 
yeah, also serve as, as the ally of the United States. <coughs> I think this is one important point about um, uh, the forced recruitment thing. Siam had also mentioned that a lot of um, young Kurds actually left um, the Kurdish parts of Syria because of the um, uh, repression of the PYD. We have to say that there has, at least until now, until lately, there has not been any, there hasn't been any war, there hasn't been any bombing, or at least not in, in, in the Jazeera and until, until the Turkish army went into Afrin, not in Afrin. So it wasn't really a real war why young Kurds left the region, but it was basically or very often because of um, the repression and persecution by the PYD, by the PKK. So a lot of human rights violations, CM had mentioned arrests of um, uh, journalists, arrests of activists, arrests of politicians. He mentioned um, uh, political murder of up to 40 persons since um, uh, 2011. He also mentioned that people, even though they have the Syrian citizenship, were kicked out of Syria and deported to Iraq and told not to come back, otherwise they would have been um, uh, killed. All these kind of human rights violations are quite well documented. So the question is, why does the West still, or large parts of the West, still perceive the PYD as a democratic organization? Um, you, you quoted um, uh, CNN, I think, um, who say it's, it's a, a model for, for, for democracy. And indeed, there are a lot of scholars which also do have this opinion. And um, so the question is why? Why don't people see the human rights violations committed by the PYD. I think there are, there are indeed different reasons why this is the case. And um, uh, if, you're, if you're talking to, to analysts in, in Europe, particularly in Germany, and if you mention those human rights violations, um, the reaction is mostly the same. There are basically two arguments they always, um, uh, they always um, uh, give you. The first one is, well, maybe the PYD is not the most democratic um, organization you can find in this world, but at least they did establish some kind of stability in the Kurdish parts of Syria. They, they, they were successful to, 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 to keep the Syrian army out of um, Syrian Kurdistan. They were successful to establish some kind of administration there, so um, uh, stability is basically seen as some, something positive. So this is one of the arguments um, why those people still think they should not really criticize the PYD. I mean, uh, the stability argument is of course not a very good argument. Um, if, if we believe that stability, no matter what kind of stability is what we need, um, then we can forget about human rights and then we can forget about um, uh, democratization. Then uh, we have to ask why trying to remove the Assad regime um, Syria was very stable for years, for, for decades before the Syrian revolution started. So uh, stability has nothing really to do with democracy and has not a lot to do with, with human rights. So I think uh, the stability argument really um, is not the best one. But there is also a second argument which is often mentioned when talking about the, the PYD and when arguing why one should not really criticize the PYD. And this is that the PYD or the PKK are an organization founded in the Middle East and in the Middle East in general, democracy is not very strong. So um, uh, one should not really wonder the PKK, this is the argument, is not much better than, than, than maybe other regimes and other governments, but um, uh, it's also not worse. And maybe that's true but it's also a quite strange argument, I believe, at least from people who earn their money by writing reports about, for example, human rights violations in Syria, human rights violations in Turkey, human rights violations in Iraq, human rights violations in Iran. They believe that all these human rights violations have to be mentioned. And the only organization which is allowed to commit human rights violations without being criti criticized should be the PKK, the PYD. I think this is also not very, um, uh, I mean, this is not logic. It doesn't make any sense. Very often those people then say, well, you know, the PYD, the PKK is a guerrilla organization. We have to have different standards on them. 
And maybe this was true before the PKK did establish really a government in Syria. We always have to have in mind that in Syrian Kurdistan, the PKK really is not a guerrilla organization. Well, it is one. It, 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 is, a, it is a guerrilla organization with fighters, but it's the government there. So we also have to, to measure them on the same standards as we usually measure governments. And I think um, uh, the argument to say, well, yeah, there might be some human rights violations, but it's just um, the mistakes of a, of a government which is very young and which is not really mature yet and which um, uh, does not really uh, have a lot of experience is also quite fails because if you, if you have a look for a longer period of time on the human rights violations committed by the PYD and by the PKK, then you see very, very clearly that it is a very systematic way in how they, they um, commit these human rights violations. It's very clear that they are not interested, and this is also something uh, CM had already said, they are very strictly and hierarchically organized um, organizations. They are simply not willing to share power, and they are simply not willing to allow for any kind of opposition. So forget about the freedom of press in Syrian Kurdistan. You can forget about um, the freedom of association. Um, you can forget about the freedom of opinion. All these freedoms are not uh, granted by the PYD. And um, uh, this shows that the human rights violations committed by them are indeed um, uh, very, very um, uh, systematic. Um, yeah, I, I think I stop here. Maybe, maybe one point which you also um, uh, mentioned very briefly one reason, um, I mean, the PYD and the PKK, and this is something um, uh, maybe other Kurdish political parties have to learn from, they are really very good in propaganda and they know exactly how they have to treat, for example, um, uh, mostly male Western journalists that go to um, uh, um, Syrian Kurdistan in order to spend some time there, talk to some people. You can be absolutely sure that they will always present them a female fighters. You can be absolutely sure that those female fighters will always be very pretty. So they are really very good in, in, in painting their own picture, which is contrasting very much the picture of these um, uh, old men with long beard, um, which are usually presented um, uh, by other Kurdish political parties. So um, uh, they are quite good in, 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 in trying to, to appear um, very Western on the one hand. Um, uh, in fact, uh, those who really take decisions in the PKK are in no way women, but it's also men, so um, it's just um, uh, the outside. But they are really good in, in presenting themselves as an organization which, which is really um, uh, engaged in women's rights, which it is not, but this is something um, uh, people really believe in, so um, uh, they, they, they give they give the West, in a way, the idea that they are the only ones which really believe in Western values and can therefore be a real ally of the West, much more than, um, uh, for example, uh, other Kurdish political parties, much more than, for example, um, uh, uh, the Turkish government, much more, for example, than uh, the Syrian opposition um, with all its uh, religious figures. So. Uh, this is something we have to have in mind if we try to understand why people don't see the human rights violations which are committed by the PYD, by the PKK. Thank you. Well, we talk about the oppression against the Kurdish opposition and that they were not tolerated. There is also this side of the story. They say that uh, we allies supporting PKK say that in Arab populated regions like Mimlich and Raqqa uh, were taken by them and they say that there's a democratic administration together with Arabs there. So in fact, I don't know how PKK can work with an Arab op opposition considering that they cannot even tolerate their Kurdish opposition. Also PKK is, is presented as a secular movement and that they can act as a secular ally of the Western world, whereas you see people with beards or conservative people or 
other sorts of people and that they refer to this comparison between themselves and the others, th which is an interesting phenomenon, then maybe in this sense they say we are against a religious dictatorship, so we are in favor of a secular dictatorship maybe, but we're talking about a dictatorship at the end of the day. This is a totalitarian dictatorship. Why do should we feel we have to choose one of them? Again, Mr. Siamant also mentioned that they identify the curriculum, and Ms. Eva also referred to that. They operate as a government. They, in fact, raise a generation, which means a problem in the long term, because PKK did not have such an opportunity before. In Turkey or, or uh, northern Iraq, they did not have the opportunity to raise generations starting with primary school. But we see that they are communicating this uh, toxic, poisonous ideology to these students. This is a problem for Syrian Kurds as well as uh, other relevant organizations. For example, KJK says that we want to free Abdullah Öcalan, which is as another threat that targets Turkey. So in fact, we can see the sort of challenges brought uh, to Turkey in terms of Syria. Okay, we refer to secularism versus other religious looking opposition, but we see this phenomenon. They say that Syria has been a place of attraction for foreign fighters after the outbreak of the civil war. We saw an influx of fighters within the next one year. And here we see people uh, joining Al Nusra and Daesh or ISIS. Uh, they, these radicalized Muslims joined from different parts of the world, including Europe. On the other hand, we see again uh, radicalized uh, Kurdish uh, people in Europe or other marginal, marginal groups within Europe joining PKK. And they are fighting for PKK. These are also within the category of foreign fighters and that they also pose a security threat when they go back to their countries because they get a good uh, capability of using developed weapons. They know how to make hand uh, uh, hand weapons. I s foresee such a threat. I want to explain it briefly. We see that right-wing parties, in fact, have uh, a rise in Europe. In Austria, for example, uh, AFD w is about to surpass SPD in Germany. Maybe it will be a second party in another election. So the extreme right is on the rise in Europe. And one of the groups is, is the leftist groups, as you know, in Europe. And I am curious about the sort of security gap we can have Europe. I have serious concerns about that. But Europe turns a deaf ear to that. Now we have a speaker who has produced work on that, uh, Kyle Orton, and he will be telling us about the foreign fighters joining PKK ranks, from which regions they come from, which, with which motivations. The floor is yours, Mr. Orton. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, good. Um, I'll pick up where the last speaker left off in terms of, uh, because as we've seen with the other foreign fighters in Syria, the line between propaganda and recruitment is actually very thin. It's often in the Islamic State, the their media department people ended up being the people who guided the attacks around the world because the people who draw people to the message are also the people who can draw in the recruits as well. And that's happened with the PKK, YPG in Syria, where there have been European citizens who've been drawn to it. I should take a step back here. I, the report I did, I profiled 60 of the people who've gone to join the YPG PKK, including the 29 who were dead at the time. So this was last August. Um, for reasons simply of the scale of it, because as has been mentioned here, the actual, the number of foreigners, as in non-Syrians within the PYD, YPG ranks is very large. Uh, and if you tried to profile everybody, it would just be impossible. 
and the other element was to try and see about this element of uh, non-Kurdish people who were coming in to join who didn't have uh, a kind of ethnic solidarity with it, the PKK, as you say, presents itself as the Kurds, and they are the representative, and in that has a resonance, uh, especially when it comes to Turkey, um, or rather the fight against Turkey. But So I wanted to take that component out of it and just see the people who've been drawn in purely by the messaging, uh, who didn't have any of these familial connections or anything. Uh, and that was the, so I proceeded on that basis. Um, the intent was to see, do they have a profile? Is there a is there some group of people who are drawn to it? Are there some people who we know will definitely go for it? And the, the short answer to give away the findings is no. Um, it was really quite various. There were certain threads in it, but it was um, it was really across the spectrum. There, it became more ideological over time, um, and actually that's where I wanted to where I wanted to begin. So I would say that there are basically three periods of foreign fighter recruitment for the YPG in Syria. There is the period between the beginning of the war in 2011 or really 2012 for the YPG because that was when uh, the Assad regime pulled back and the YPG took over areas in northern Syria and up to the Kobani battle in 2014, so October time in 2014. Then there's the Kobani period which saw a major influx of people and this went on until about middle, the middle of 2015. And then we have the current phase which is um, much more ideological, which I'll get to now. Uh, so in the early phase, the, the main noticeable factor about people was that they were military veterans. Um, some of them had had trouble adapting to civilian life and it was easier to be back in a, a war zone. But there was also a very uh, significant component of people who'd been involved in the Iraq war against the Islamic State. And um, they essentially wanted to finish the job as they saw ISIS rising again and people were not paying attention, they went to uh, make sure that their sacrifices previously hadn't been, hadn't been in vain. The anti-ISIS component of um, the motivation and of the messaging of the PYD has been really significant. Like that's the, the major thing that's drawn people in, is just that the Islamic State is so hideous an organization, we are fighting it. If you come and help us, you can fight against it as well. And that's had a very strong moral pull to people. Uh, then there were the uh, people who wanted adventure, so uh, if they were, they just wanted to see what it was like, or they wanted to tour Syria, they would often go in through the YPG. Um, there was, uh, at this stage, a small ideological component, so ideologically left-wing, and some of them even directly um, in touch with, like, Orchelan's ideology, or even uh, the, the anarchist threads that came in later. One of these people was a man called Kevin Joachim, who was killed in July 2015. He was the seventh foreign fighter killed. Uh, and he'd come from Germany. He was a f military veteran as well. Uh, but he'd become a Marxist at a certain point and then had found Ocalan's ideology. And then in November 2012, he went to Syria um, and stayed there for just under three years before he was killed. And there was a small component of people like that who'd come, from, come in from Europe. Uh, once the Kobani battle begins, and it becomes uh, a, a very large like, media sensation internationally, it's uh, not just, it, it's not even presented as just a Kurdish question at that time. It's because the coalition then comes in on the YPG side as well. And it, it mobilizes a great number of people who come in uh, to f mostly to fight ISIS is their, um, their main motivation. And actually it establishes because of it gets so much attention at that time and the PYD capitalizes on the attention to make sure its own message about the battle is put out, the, that's where the PYD establishes the two major themes of its messaging, which is that it's against ISIS and it's a democratic experiment in secularism and this kind of thing. And I say a lot of people come in. Now, again, a lot of them were military veterans who thought that their skills could be useful in pushing back ISIS. Um, and that was, it, that led to some slight trouble because a lot of the military veterans, especially from the United States, tended to be Christians. And they were not fully aware of the politics of the YPG. And when it became clear that they were in some, some quasi-communist organization, a lot of them left and went and joined Christian militias uh, in Iraq. So that was one element of um, people leaving it. But the Kurds from around Syria also came in. There were less um, admirable motives. There were, again, adventurers and people who came in. 
there were also people who saw a chance to um, either make a name for themselves or to make money, uh, who went in as essentially war tourists to get footage that they then tried to sell abroad, or to get um, some version of experience that they could then use to uh, sell elsewhere. There were more troubled people. Um, some of them were disturbed people who would, didn't quite know what was happening, but were drawn in by the sort of spectacle of it. Um, there were some people who just wanted to kill people and thought this was a chance to do that. Um, but there was a larger number who were what I would call looking for redemption. Um, they had had troubled lives often. Some of them were petty criminals. They'd been arrested or they had uh, drug habits. And they found, a, they found a cause that they could go to. And I, it seems to have worked for a lot of them. They seem to have uh, left behind whatever troubles it was when they went and joined the YPG. The YPG understood the, the problems it had with this contingent that had come in that was not always particularly well trained, um, but was very useful as a messaging prop to be able to put out their message to people to say, we need help, which they got at the time. Um, but it, it caused some troubles within their ranks, especially the people who, were, um, who had mental issues and things. There were reports of it, people who would just didn't feel safe being in the same barracks as certain people. So, but the, as they started professionalizing this intake in the early 2015, the PYD started getting rid of these people and they would be expelled from its ranks uh, once it had stabilized itself and was able to, it didn't need everybody then to, everybody who it could to help. It could be more choosy about it. Uh, in June 2015, they established the um, Internationalist Freedom Battalion. And it, from that moment, you can sort of, it's a useful, marker of the change in their recruitment pattern um, because they, they were a lot less, but they were a lot more, um, they were a lot more willing at the same time. They, they actually sort of looked for people to come in rather than just accepting the people who did, uh, but it was more selective. And it, ten, it was at that point that they start recruiting communists and anarchists uh, and other hard left elements who come in. And it becomes a much more uh, kind of utopian themed um, project. The, the propaganda becomes much more focused on that rather than just the, um, just the anti-ISIS element. They play up the, the actual ideological aspect of it. Um, so to speak out the numbers of it, the, the short answer is that it's, nobody really knows how many people have gone out from Europe and, and North America to join uh, the YPG. The numbers at last summer, the best numbers I saw were around 800. Um, that's probably higher now. It would over a thousand is a reasonable estimate um, of how that's gone, um, but there's just there's no real way to know because they don't they don't often tell people that they've gone there, and once they are there, they stay hidden unless the YPG puts them in their their videos. So we just tend not to know. Um, the largest numbers of people tended to come from the English-speaking world, particularly the United States and Britain. Germany was the next largest after that. Uh, it's not entirely unexpected in the sense that a lot of the global media environment is English language, uh, is in the English language. Uh, so the YPG had more chance to, to reach that, those audiences. And the PKK has a very large and well-established infrastructure in Germany, so it was able to, to mobilize that. Um, the recruits tended to be young. 60% uh, of them were under 30, and 80% of them were under 40. Uh, as was mentioned here, uh, the Female fighters feature very prominently in propaganda, but the actual numbers are very small. Um, it was over 90%, excuse me, over 95% were male in the sample I found. There was just three females um, that had gone out. Uh, in terms of their employment patterns, so their, their lifestyle and jobs, uh, it ranged from builders to lawyers to florists, corporate traders. Th there was no set pattern. The only two occupations that had any concentration were the military people and students uh, who seemed to, who were more represented than anybody else. Um, how this plays out now is, I think, the question, we, we are approaching, in a sense, the end of one phase of the war and the beginning of the next one. And the foreign fighters are going to be a part of that. I, I think we've begun to see that some of them are going to go into the war directly with Turkey. Um, there are some YPG fighters like uh, Carl Gubrinson from Norway who joined the PKK openly rather than just the YPG. Uh, and Zosan Tamir, another foreign fighter with the YPJ in Syria who was killed in an airstrike inside Turkey a few weeks ago. Um, so there are 
this movement of, is already happening, and that's going to be a problem. Uh, there's also the problem that in the YPG areas, there are training is being given, obviously, in these camps, but some groups from Southern Europe, some left-wing groups, especially from Greece and Spain and Italy, have begun to go deliberately to acquire training. Like They've gone as groups rather than individuals. And there are signs from uh, Europol, from uh, Europe's answer to the FBI, basically. Their, their reports on this suggest that these groups are linking up and forming more of a unified network, which I think may be a, a problem to look out for in uh, the coming years. Uh, the main problem, I think, though, overall, oh, sorry, one more. The actual problem within the West is going to be when, if these people come home and they get involved in the PKK's networks. Um, I think the, the domestic terrorism problem it's one of those that it's there and it should be worried about in the sense that you've got people who've got training and have radical politics, so it's never a good uh, combination. But it's uh, the main problem, I think, is that they will be involved in the PKK's uh, media and financial infrastructure so that they will be disseminating propaganda that will recruit other people and they'll be involved in this uh, criminal aspect that the PKK uses to, rec to finance itself. Um, it for the war mostly in Turkey and now also in Syria. So that's from, I think the, the major implication that this sort of immediate headline one is the one that we can now see in Northern Syria, which is that um, these people are an especially potent symbol of the, the problem of Western policy in a sense, that the, the Western focus on ISIS that allowed this problem to grow up as a side effect has damaged relations with Turkey very badly within NATO. And it's a, it becomes sort of, it's more of a media flashpoint when one of these people is going to be killed inside Syria, uh, and I, excuse me, inside Turkey. And I think that it's just going to help, or rather keep pushing us towards a deterioration of relations, which is not good. Especially in terms of knowing the profile, that was very useful. Uh, we saw, you know, there are many dimensions to one subject, but especially recently, the speaker indicated, people who go to Syria from Spain, from Greece, we have extreme left wings. They are not individuals, but, you know, they are forming groups and using those places as training locations, and they are forming networks in Europe. So Syria, from now on, is not only a radical... Uh, It's not a, you know, it, it has not only a lab or school for the groups who claim they are supporting Islam, uh, but from the extreme left-wing groups, there is this role which has been assumed, especially in the northern Syria. And in the long term, uh, you know, if you remember the Afghanistan uh, policy of USA, the, you know, in terms of demolishing SSCB, there was this support. And uh, the United States has found that in 1990s, Osama bin Laden was announced a big hero in New York Times. Just remember those times. And, you know, as of today, you know, in the long term, this might uh, have adverse repercussions. In the short term, in terms of relations with Turkey, this is going to pose a lot of difficulties because... Uh, you know, there is a, a major issue of Turkey which is ignored and the policies uh, have brought us to this. After six years, Turkey had to intervene Syria and our relations with USA and with some other NATO allies have been uh, significantly strained and challenged. And there are different repercussions brought by that. There is this Russia element and Russia is uh, expanding its scope as we speak every day. So it's not only Syria per se. There are repercussions and implications for Turkey, for the region, for the relationships uh, of Turkey and the other countries and European countries as well. Well, now I would like to open the floor.